to another episode of Let's Rep. We want to thank each and every one for taking the time out of your busy day to listen to our Let's Rep podcast. Today, we're going to be covering part two of our series, A Divine Encounter with God, dealing with spiritual encounter. On our last episode, we opened up the beginning of this series talking about our social encounters. We entered into the life of Jacob and learned from the time that he was in his mother's womb, he struggled with knowing how to deal with his social encounters. Even from the womb, Jacob struggled with his brother Esau and it continued even after he made his entrance into the world. We found that out as he grabbed a hold to Esau's heel coming out. Jacob's name we learned means surplanter, replacer, underminer, deceiver. And man, oh man, has Jacob lived up to that name thus far. Now, just looking at this scripture and reading the story of Jacob's life, we would think that this was just a part, a normal part of his characteristic. But as we dig deeper into the word, we learn that it didn't just start with Jacob. Through studying the book of Genesis, we learned that Abraham, Jacob's grandfather, the one that it all began with, was indeed a trickster. Yes, that's right. Abraham himself was a trickster. He deceived King Abimelech, king of Jair, telling him that Sarah was not his wife, but indeed she was his sister. And if it had not been for the Lord revealing to the king that this was not his sister, but in fact his wife, he may have gotten away with it. We also know that Abraham did this more than once, and Abraham came out with more than he went in with each time. One might would think that that would have been the end of it, but no, not at all. Generation curses run in the family. Why do I say that? Because we read in the scripture years later that Isaac himself lies to King Abimelech. He goes down to the land of the Philistines and he tells the king that Rebekah, Jacob's mother, is indeed his sister and not his wife. The same trick, the same deception that Abraham pulled, Isaac is now pulling the same thing over the king. As we take a look at the whole dynamics of this dysfunctional family, poor Jacob didn't stand a chance. He ended up with a double portion of this spirit running through his veins. Isaac took his wife from Abraham's nephew, Bethel, and that was the youngest son of Nahor and Milcai. Remember that Bethel is the father of Laban and Rebekah. So Jacob has a double portion of this generation curse following him. So rightly so, his name is a planner. Rightly so, his name is deceiver. Rightly so, is he a surplanter and an underminer. It runs in the family. No doubt he learned this spirit of deception from his mother, from his father, from his grandfather. He learned all this. It's not just in his characteristic as we would first uh, think, but it's deeper than that. This thing runs down to the root. It goes way back. The truth of the matter is many of us today are dealing with generation curses just like Jacob. It didn't just start with you, baby. I always say, shake the family tree. If you're a liar or your child is a liar, check the family tree. I guarantee you there's lying in the family. If there's manipulation going on, shake the family tree. I guarantee you, your mother was a manipulator. Your father was a manipulator. Most of the time we look at families. If you see alcoholism in the family, check the family. There's several alcoholics throughout the family. Divorce. Divorce doesn't just start. Divorce, if you check the family tree, I guarantee you there's a history of divorce in the family. There's a history of drug abuse in the family. There's a history of homosexuality in the family. There's a history of adultery going on in the family. There's a history of witchcraft going on in the family. Check, check the family tree. So we see in the first episode that Jacob was struggling. Not only did Jacob trick Esau out of his birthright, in which because Esau despised his birthright, he was more than willing to sell for a bowl of soup, but more than anything, with the help of his mother, Rebecca, he stole Esau's blessing. Last week, we saw where his own mother not only facilitated, but aided in him lying and tricking 
his father Isaac into thinking that Jacob was Esau in order that he might obtain the blessing that belonged to Esau. And we know what happened after that. We learned that as soon as Esau came in on the scene and he realized that his father had indeed blessed Jacob instead of him because Jacob tricked him out of the blessing, Esau was devastated. Not only was he devastated, but he was angry. He was so angry that he declared that he was going to kill Jacob. And because he had put a bounty out on Jacob, because he declared that he would kill him, they had to send Jacob away. His mother decided that it was best if Jacob would go to live with her brother or stay with the brother Laban until Esau's anger had passed. So it is right about here once again, we see history in this family repeating itself. Yes, Abraham sent his servant down to Haran in order to find a wife for Isaac among his own family, among his own people, because he didn't want him to marry a Canaanite woman. And again, we see that Rebecca went to Isaac and declared to Isaac that she would die if Jacob married a Hittite woman. So Isaac is now on his deathbed prior to giving him the blessing of Abraham over his life is telling Jacob that he needs to not marry a Canaanite woman. But instead, he commanded him that he would go down to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, in northwest Mesopotamia, where Laban, your mother brother, lives, and I want you to marry one of his daughters. So Jacob obeyed his mother and his father, and he went on about his way. As soon as uh, Esau had learned that Isaac had given Jacob the blessing and sent him to northwest Mesopotamia to find his wife there, he was very upset. So what did he do? He took it upon himself to go down to the land of the Canaanites, which was Ishmael's, Abraham's other son's um, clan, and find himself a wife among Ishmael's daughters. So he went and married one of Ishmael's daughter by the name of Mahalatheth. So we know that Esau was hurt. Esau was rebelling. And he did this just despite his mother and his father and Jacob. He wanted to show them that since this is not what you want for Jacob, this is what I'm going to go do. So we covered so much last week in social encounter, learning how the struggle was real within the social encounter. And we talked about our own personal social encounters and how we deal and how we long for human relationship and to be friends with people and to, and to maintain these relationships. But just like Jacob, just like Esau, just like Abraham and Isaac, even Rebecca, we lack the characteristics that we need in order to maintain these relationships successfully. Because the truth of the matter is many of us are dealing with generation curses that have been following our family from generation to generation. Now we see that Jacob is finding himself at a place of his spiritual encounter. Let's take a look at what the word spiritual encounter means. First of all, a spiritual encounter is experience or a move of God supernaturally or experiencing having vision or dreams. When we look at the Bible in Genesis, the 28th chapter, and this uh, social, this spiritual encounter begins with verse 10. And it reads, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. Remember, Haran is where he's headed to, where the house of Laban, Rebekah's brother. When he came to a place, he spent the night there because the sun had set. He found a stone and he laid his head on it to go to sleep. Jacob dreamed that there was a ladder resting on the earth that reached up to the heavens. He saw angels of God going up and coming down the ladder. Then Jacob saw the Lord standing above the ladder, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your grandfather, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants this land, which you are now sleeping on. Your descendants will be many as the dust of the earth. They will spread west and east, north and south. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. I am with you. I will protect you. Everywhere you go, I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done as I have promised you. And we see the Bible says in Genesis 28, the 16th verse, then Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, but I did not know it. The Lord began to show me right about there 
that it's possible for us, just like Jacob, to have a spiritual encounter and still not know he was there or who he is. The Bible says that Jacob was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place, that this is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Many of us today go into the house of God week after week after week, and we have a spiritual encounter, but never actually enter in into a divine encounter with God. He began to tell me, he said, too many of my people know of me just like Jacob, but they don't know me. What am I talking about? And why do I say that Jacob didn't know him? Because when we look at verse 20, verse 20 says, then Jacob made a promise. He said, I want God to be with me and to protect me on this journey. I want him to give me food to eat and clothes to wear. So I will be able to return to this place to my father's house. If the Lord does these things, he will be my God. It was right about here that the Lord began to show me. He said, Jacob vowed a vow to me without really knowing who I was. He said, too many of my people are guilty of making vows to me based on spiritual encounters rather than trusting me for who I am. Now the Lord really had my attention. I was wondering where he was going with this. He began to say to me, Shanina, look at verse 20 again. He said, Jacob said, if such a little word that means so much, he said, if God will be with me and will keep me wherever I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, then I will come again to my father's house, to this place in peace. Then he shall be my God. There it is. God said, then, then shall the Lord be my God. Jacob at this season, in his life had made a vow to the God and was serving God like many of us based on conditions. No doubt somebody's listening to me right now is saying, what are you talking about? Elder Walker, Jacob was at the season in his life where he made a vow and he was serving God. God said, based on conditions, Jacob said, if Lord, you will be with me, if you will keep me, if you will give me bread, if you will give me clothes, I will come again to my father's house. Many of us are just like Jacob today. We might not say, God, if you will give me bread or if you will give me clothes, but how about if you will give me the job, Lord, I'm going to pay my tithes. If you will give me the job, Lord, I'm going to sow into the ministry. If you will give me a husband and a wife, Lord, I'm going to be able to have somebody to worship with, somebody to pray with God. If you will give me the position on the job, Lord, I'm going to give you the praise. What about this one we're notorious for? Lord, if you will give me a new car, I'm going to go by and pick up Sister Sally, bring her to church, Lord. If, Lord, if. Many times we say if to God when God is saying, what do you mean if? God began to speak to my heart and he said, look at this thing, Shanina. Here Jacob is talking about if when his father had already pronounced a blessing over his life. When we look back into the chapter where Isaac was giving uh, Jacob the blessing, he was beginning to tell him, you're going to be a great people. You're going to receive this. You're going to be mighty. Your descendants and your seed is going to be great. He had already pronounced the blessing over his life, telling him what it was going to be and what was going to be his. Yet here Jacob stand saying, if I could just imagine the father looking down on Jacob saying, what do you mean? If I just allowed you to have a spiritual encounter with me, I told you who I was. The Bible says that the Lord himself Jacob looked up when he looked up his eyes. He saw the Lord standing above the ladder and he said, the Lord, let him know I am the Lord, your God. I am the God of Abraham, your grandfather and the God of Isaac. And he began to tell him what he was going to do, how he was going to bless him. He began to tell him that your descendants will be as many as the dust as the, of the earth. They're going to spread from the West and the East and the North and the South. He began to tell him that he was going to bless him and all of his descendants. Yet he's standing here in doubt talking about if, why is Jacob saying if I submit to you today that Jacob doubted God because he knew of him, but he didn't know him at this point in Jacob's life. He only knew God as the God of his grandfather, Abraham. He only knew God as the God of his father, Isaac, but he didn't know him personally. Oh yeah, no doubt. He worshiped him faithfully going through the motions like many of us for whatever reason, maybe for the material things that we read about for food, for raiment, for clothing, for peace to bring him back to that place of his father's and his mother's home, maybe out of obligation to family tradition. 
because Abraham, his grandfather did it because Isaac, his father did it. It just seemed like the right thing to do. So he was going to do it. Or perhaps just like he had manipulated so many others, Jacob felt like he could manipulate God into getting what he wanted. You know how we do. Some of us are just master manipulators and we manipulated man so long. We feel like we, we can treat God like man and we want to manipulate God and try to get the things that we want from God. So we make all these bargains and we make all these vows to God, declaring that we're going to do this. God, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again. As soon as the Lord gives some relief from the situation or the circumstance, what do you do? You turn Turn around and go right back to the mess. Like the Bible says, a dog to his vomit. Continue to go through the same thing over and over again. Saints, we don't have to allow generation curses. We don't have to allow ourselves to continue to go through the same patterns and cycles of life over and over again. We can have a divine encounter with God and our lives can be changed forever. But we see here that Jacob had not learned a thing from his experience thus far. It was clear to see that Jacob was so self-centered and concerned about his own needs that he was not even hearing what God had already pronounced over his life that he was going to automatically do for him. We all know that God is not a man that he would lie. If God said he was going to bless him, he was going to bless him. He said he was going to bring him back to that place. He will bring him back to that place. But here he is trying to bargain with God. Here he is talking about if God, you do this. And if you do that, then you'll be my God. Not knowing that God has been there all along. All he's doing is waiting on him to to call on his name that he might experience that divine encounter with God and his life might be changed forever. But we see here that Jacob left this place where the presence of the Lord was having experienced nothing but a spiritual encounter, but no change at all. I said that to say, don't be fooled by going to church. Don't be fooled by going into the house of worship, worshiping God and the spirit of the Lord come upon you. There's a difference between a spiritual encounter and a divine encounter with God. Divine encounter causes changes in our life. Spiritual encounter, only a movement. A spiritual encounter will cause you to be moved emotionally. A spiritual encounter will be cause you to be moved in your flesh, in your five senses, but it will not change your life. A divine encounter with God is what we long for in order to be changed. We have got to stop confusing a spiritual encounter with a divine encounter. We know that thus far, Jacob has experienced social encounter. He has just experienced his spiritual encounter, but now he's on his way to the house of Laban, his mother's brother. We're going to see he's going to go back to experiencing a social encounter. And the Bible says in Genesis 29th chapter, beginning at the 30th verse, that after he arrived to Haran, the house of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob began to experience what he himself had been so willing to inflict on others. Ain't that like God? So many times we don't get it until we ourselves begin to experience the same hurt that we have put upon others. Once we uh, feel the pain of what we've inflicted on others, Then for some reason in our mental psyche, things begin to click in on us. Now the Bible says that Laban had two daughters, one named Leah, one named Rachel. Rachel was beautiful. So Jacob agreed to serve his uncle Laban for seven years for Rachel, only to be tricked and manipulated by his uncle and given the oldest daughter Leah. But because he loved Rachel so much, he was willing to serve another seven years just for her. Now we see here that the law of the harvest is taking place. It is here that Jacob began to reap the bad seeds of what he has sown. Many times we can go up through life spreading bad seeds all around and expect to get a good harvest. I beg to differ. If you plant bad seeds, you're going to get a bad harvest. The Bible says we reap what we sow. The thing about this harvest and this planting thing, you might plant a seed, but you're going to get a tree, which is going to produce much more than you planted. Now, Jacob began to reap the bad seeds that he had sown. Not only did he have to serve for a total of 14 years for Rachel, because Jacob loved Rachel so much and Leah was hated, the Lord blessed the womb of Leah and caused Rachel to be barren. So not only did he serve 14 years for Rachel, the one he really loved, but now that he done served 14 years for, the Lord has closed up her womb and she's barren. 
he is reaping what he sowed. I constantly say this again and again, because one thing I've learned, if nothing else, throughout my entire lifetime, is the law of the harvest is real. Just like it's real in the natural, even more so in the spirit. For every decision we make outside of the will of God, there are consequences. And although the spiritual effects of your bad actions may be forgiven, in the flesh, there are still consequences that we have to suffer. What do I mean? I mean, you may think you have gotten away, but you have not gotten by. You go out and you have an affair, you cheat, you do things, and okay, maybe you got by, maybe you got past it, but later on down the road, you find out that you've contracted HIV or AIDS. Okay, the law of the harvest is real. Now you're reaping that. Just because you accepted Christ, just because you got saved, that don't mean that you're not going to pay the consequences for your actions. You go out and rob a bank, you may have gotten away with it, but down the road, guess what? They finally catch up to you. And now you got to serve time in jail. Just because you don't got saved does not mean you exempt from serving that time in jail. You did the crime. Now it's time to do the time. We have to know that the law of the harvest is real. We have to pay for the consequences and the choices that we make in our life. Just like God allowed Jacob to reap the hardship and endure a bitter life in order to purge his character God is going to do the same thing in us today. He's not going to let us get by. When we face hardship, when we go through hard times, when we go through troubles, we want to cry to God and we just act like everybody done done us wrong in the world. But no, God is building character in us. God was building Jacob's character for everything that he had went through. All that mess that was down on the inside of him, all those generation curses that he had, that had followed him throughout his lifelong line. God had to work all that stuff out of him. There was only one way for him to ever be able to see the totality of what he had inflicted on others. What? It had to come back on him the same way he gave it to others. God will allow us to go through things and then he will show us you're reaping what you sowed. You sowed that. Your children act like they act because you sowed that. You going through what you went through because you did that. God will show you. He will show you you, if nothing else. He will do the same thing to us today. God is not marked. Whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he reap. Some of us are just reaping what we sowed. So all we can do now is pray for strength to be able to bear it and hold on to Jesus. James 1 and 4 tell us, let endurance have its perfect result, that you will be mature, complete, you won't need anything. It said, let endurance. We have to learn how to endure and go through in the hard times. Endure and go through when things don't look like we think they ought to look. We have to endure some of the seeds that we done planted. Now it's time to, to reap the harvest of those bad seeds. We're going to have to be able to endure it and let endurance have its perfect result in you. If endurance have its perfect result in us, the Bible says we shall be mature. We shall be complete and not needing anything. I tell you the truth. I have been through some things and now I am mature in those areas. It is some things that I won't go back to again. It's some seeds that I refuse to plant again. And I'm sure many of you guys feel the same way. It's some things in your life that you will not see again. As the Bible said, the enemy you see today, you will see no more. There are some enemies in my life I will never see again because I've learned from those situations. I have allowed the Lord to work in the character of my life concerning those situations. Now the Bible tells us that God used Jacob, uncle Laban to knock him down from a, to a place of humbleness. When God brings situations in our lives, just like Jacob, he don't bring them to hurt us. He bring them into our life to humble us. He bring those uh, situations and circumstance in our life that he might build character in us, that it might work is perfect work in us, that we might be complete and not wanting anything in the end. The Bible says that Jacob finally met his match and Laban proved to be more cunning and outwitting than Jacob could have ever been. He took advantage of Jacob, Jacob at every turn for a better of more than 20 years. We know that throughout our study, we see that he served for Rachel for 14 years. And then he served another six years for the cattle that he tended to for Laban. And Laban changed his wages more than 10 times throughout the time he was with him. 
The book of Genesis, the 31st chapter tells us that finally, after 20 years of going through a character transformation, that God knew Jacob was finally ready. So the Lord spoke to Jacob to return to the land of his fathers in which he had promised him to return to the land of his kindreds to let him know that he was going to be with him. Didn't I tell you the Lord is not a man that he should lie? That same promise that he gave him at Beersheba, that he told him that I will bring you back into the land of your fathers, of your kindreds. The Lord is about to make good on that promise. He's telling Jacob now, it's time for you to go back home to the land of your father. As we look at Genesis, the 31st chapter, we in the 11th verse, we see that Jacob is going back now into another spiritual encounter. So as we study this entire study, we see he's going out of a social encounter into a spiritual encounter, back into a social encounter. Now he's back into a spiritual encounter. But we see that in this verse, um, Genesis, the 31st chapter and 11th verse, Jacob is having a different response following this spiritual encounter than he had the first time. In the 11th verse, it says, and the angel of the Lord spoken to me in a dream saying, Jacob, and I said, here am I. And he lifted up his eyes. I have seen all that Laban has done unto thee. So God is speaking to him through the angel saying that he has seen everything that Laban has done. I believe that this is where God wants us to get. He wants us to be to a place where we're willing to say to him, Lord, here am I. He wants us to lift up our eyes to the hills which cometh our help. He sees exactly what you've been through. He sees exactly what you're going through. If you are listening to me right now and you're going through a situation or a circumstance, I want you to know that just like God saw Jacob, God sees you and he's not going to leave you, nor is he going to forsake you. He's going to see you through that situation. But before he see you out of it, he's going to build some character in you. I want you to join me next week as we continue on our four-part series entitled A Divine Encounter with God. Next week, we're going to see where Jacob leaves the house of Laban and enter into his own personal encounter. How many know that there comes a time in our life where we have to deal with ourselves? We have to have our own personal encounter. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just thank you for this teaching, God. I thank you for you showing us the life of Jacob, where we're able to see ourselves through the scripture. God, we ask that you would just help us to be everything that you have called us to be. God, don't let us have another social encounter, another spiritual encounter. God, we don't even just want to be in a personal encounter, but most of all, we want to make it to a divine encounter with you so that our lives might be changed. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for everyone who's listening far and near from every country, every state, every city. God, just do a work in their lives right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I am Elder Shanina Walker. We want to thank you for listening to our Let's Wrap podcast. We want you to come back next week and hear part three on personal encounter. Want you to go to Facebook if you haven't done so and join us. Be a part of our Facebook family so I can get to know you and you can get to know a little more about us. When we have our Let's Wrap drawings, you can be a part of those wonderful giveaways that we do giveaway gifts. All you have to do is listen, like, comment, and share in order to be a part of our giveaway. Share, share, share this podcast. It is greatly appreciated. Once again, I love you. Elder Walker love you. But God will always love you more. Until the next time, have a blessed day.